Welcome to week three of Breakthrough. We're going to go ahead and jump right in so you can hit pause, go into your icebreaker question and the what to expect, and I'll see you right after that. Now it's time to jump into the video message for today, so make sure you have something to take notes with, and let's watch today's video message. Let's look at the story of Joseph. Here's where it begins in Genesis chapter 37. Let's start in verse 5. It says, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. Which, let me just point out, they didn't hate him because of his dream. They were already hating on him before the dream ever came. The dream just kind of pushed it over the edge. It was the straw that broke the camel's back for them. They, they were already hating on him because they were jealous of him and his relationship with, his, with their dad. And Joseph said to them very uh, unwisely, Joseph had brought a little bit of his trouble on himself, as a lot of us do. He said to them, hey, listen to my dream. While we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose up, stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around my sheaf and bowed down to it. Y'all like that dream, brothers? I I mean, think about it. To which side, you know, you know they didn't go, well, that just blesses my heart. You know, nobody, they weren't, right? So they were mad. And, and the Bible says that they conspired about how they could get rid of this, this guy. And so they're out working in the field one day, and uh, Joseph is gone out to meet them. And they see him from afar, and it picks up in verse 19 that says, here comes that dreamer. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Here's the plan. Let's kill him. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way? I'm going to take you out. I mean, just, uh, let's kill him. Let's just kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns, which is just a big pit. And let's say to dad that a ferocious animal devoured him. And let's see what comes of his dreams. Let's just see. Let's just see how far this big, big shot goes, actually, if this happens. So here's this guy who actually gets a dream from God, actually has a plan from God, actually did hear from God, probably should not have communicated it the way he did. But it was accurate. It was from God. And from that moment, it almost headed in the opposite direction for more than 23 years. So I think Joseph has earned the right to jump on the track and say, I know what you're going through. And I think he really would encourage us. And I I think his message would be very clear. Don't give up. And I'm taking this message very seriously. We're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be encouraging. It made me feel a bit simple. I think that's my job is to make hard things simple, put the cookies on the bottom shelf so everybody can have some today, all right? That's my job. But this is actually very serious. Because people get here in dangerous ways. And I stand before you in the fear of the Lord, knowing that I've heard from God to this week In fact, if you want to know the truth about it, I had a different giant planned, and on Friday changed it. I already created a completely different handout. We had our artist draw a different person for the opener. And I'm telling you, God spoke to me and said, somebody's in a dangerous place, and he changed this message. And so I did. I worked really late on Friday night and sent it to our team, and my amazing team pulled it off, thank God. Because a lot of us get to the place where we feel like giving up sometimes. Isn't that right? And I want to give you four things that I think we learned from Joseph's story about not giving up. And I want you to write these down if you're taking notes today. The first is don't give up on your dream, even if it didn't start off so well. See, a lot of us have stories that didn't start so well. And some of us are still plagued by not the potential that God has for us, but our resume, our past. And you are defining your potential not on what you see, but what you see in the rearview mirror. Now, here's God comes along and forgives you, cleanses you from all unrighteousness, 
remembers your sins no more. In his mind, it's like that little etch-a-sketch thing. Remember that thing you used to draw on, you lift the plastic thing and it all goes away? That's what God did. He didn't just forgive it. It's gone. But you have an accuser, the Bible calls him, the devil. He's the accuser of people. And his job is just to be that whisper in your ear, no, you know who you are. You know who you are. You know what you've done. And he will try to keep you from going on. He'll get you to stop by reminding you of your yesterday, which again, in God's mind, is gone. But he constantly reminds us of that stuff. And I'm going to tell you, a lot of us give up the journey because we think, you know what? I'm a messed up person. i got a, a lot of baggage. got a lot of things I've done. I've got this history that constantly is reminded of me. You guys that have been around here for a couple years, my apologies for repeating some of the stories and jokes that I tell. Y'all, I've been doing this for 11 years. I've only got so many. All right, so here we go. But I think the last time I told this for a couple, it was a couple years ago, but it just bears repeating, and, and, it's, and it's incredibly funny. But this guy's standing in a pet store, just minding his own business, and this parrot, this, full, this parrot, talking parrot, says, hey! And the guy turns and looks, and parrot, he said, me? You talking to me? Parrot said, yeah, you. He said, what? Parrot said, come here. <laughs> he goes over to that parrot. He says, what do you want? Parrot said, you're the ugliest thing I ever saw before in my whole life. <laughs> well, that kind of insulted him, as you can imagine. And he went to the pet store owner and says, your bird just insulted me. The pet store owner kind of fussed at the bird, popped him upside the beak, says, don't, don't talk to my customers that way. Thank you very much. He left, came back a month later, walking around, minding his own business. That parrot said, hey. The guy said, you talking to me? The parrot said, yeah, you. He said, what? The parrot said, come here. <laughs> he walks over to the parrot. He said, what? The parrot says, you know what? <laughs> That's funny. I don't care what y'all say. That's funny. <laughs> And I think that's the devil's job description. You know what? You know what? And what's he trying to do? He's trying to derail your potential and keep you from going on by reminding you of your bad beginning. I'm going to tell you, the Apostle Paul is the same way. The Apostle Paul had a horrible resume. I'm talking about a guy who stood and gave the order for the execution of Christians in the early church. I mean, we see him standing in, in approval and giving the order for Stephen to be stoned in Acts chapter 7. I mean, we see this is a bad dude. And, of course, God appears to him and says, you're persecuting me. That's not a cult. That's me. I'm, I'm in that. And of course, he got converted. He goes on to write two-thirds of the New Testament, great apostle, which basically means just a church planter going around and launching all these churches all across the, the known world and if you look at it, really, the Bible is full of people with horrible resumes. You ever, you ever notice that? You ever get suspicious about that? Could it be that God's trying to communicate something to you and me? That regardless of your yesterday, you can still do great things for God, and he's willing that no matter what you've done to still use you, we just got to stop listening to the lies of the devil. Amen, everybody? It's the truth. And so Paul would say things. I mean, it obviously plagued him because he says, you know what? Time, time, I want to give up. Philippians, he said, man, but I, I have to forget those things that are behind and press on toward this goal. Let me show you what I put in your notes in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1. It says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who's given me strength because I was feeling kind of weak, but he strengthened me. How did he strengthen you, Paul? Look at it. He considered me faithful, meaning I wasn't. I was a murderer, but he, can, he saw something in me I didn't see in myself. He considered me faithful. And not only that, God appointed me to his service. He lets me do something for him. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. God changed my life, wiped my resume off. I'm telling you, don't give up even if it didn't start well. Here's the second one if you're taking notes today. And that is don't give up even if those closest to you aren't supporting you. Yeah, if you're getting negative feedback or rejection from people, which for a lot of us, we get derailed, tired. Some of you are exhausted because it's, a, it's an exhaustion that comes from rejection. This would have been my story. Honestly, it's a miracle that I stand before you today based on what I experienced growing up. And I'm not looking for any sob story or sympathy. God's, God's done an amazing work in my life, and only I know how full it is. But even though I had a mom and dad who every single day of my life told me they loved me, believed in me, and saw my potential, 
Man, I felt brutalized growing up. I was terrorized in elementary and junior high school. Rejected was the outcast crowd, literally. It just It was horrible. It, 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 it had the potential to truly scar me, and it was going to keep me from my best. So I entered into college, didn't care. Just no, put forth absolutely no effort whatsoever because it didn't matter. And it all stemmed from the fact that nobody ever believed in me. My parents did. Thank God they prayed through, and God sent a few godly people along my way who encouraged me. And the truth is, a lot of us get discouraged because of rejection issues in people. And I'm going to tell you something. Even Jesus had this dilemma. As popular as his ministry was, you need to understand that his own family, his brothers and sisters, at one time they showed up at a, at a place where he's ministering, and they said, guys, we're sorry. <laughs> he doesn't really mean it when he says he's a Messiah. He's kind of out of his mind. Y'all, please excuse him. Can you imagine hearing that from your own family? And it says in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, it says, they say, say the, the people in his hometown said, this is just a carpenter. He's sitting in God. This is a woodworker, furniture builder. This is just Mary's son. This is not, a, it's not God. This is a, it's a, just a person. And he has brothers. His brother James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at Jesus. Now, this is the town where he grew up in. In fact, the Bible says that it was only in that town where he could do few miracles because of their treatment and, their, and their, their, their unbelief. And Jesus said to them, only in his hometown and among his relatives in his own house is a prophet without honor. It's a shame. So see, a lot of us experience that. Of course, that's what exp Joseph experienced as well. He experienced this massive rejection. I mean, it's one thing to be hated. But y'all, it sounds so sweet in Sunday school-ish but they were talking human trafficking. He was put into slavery, human slavery, by his own family. Here's the third thing that Joseph would tell us because he knows it firsthand. And that is, don't give up on your dream, even if your journey is full of surprises. Now, part of my job as a pastor is to help you navigate this, this Christian life I want to let you in on a little secret here. You ready for it? You're not going to like it too much, but it really will, it really will help you because it's true. And that is that when you get a dream, a vision, or a plan from God, or even one for your own life, it never goes from point A to point B in a straight line. Man, you're laughing because you know what I'm talking about, right? It zigs and zags, and there's even moments where it goes the opposite direction. And, and Joseph would come alongside and say, hey, don't give up, even if you feel like you're getting farther away than ever. And I want to rehearse with you the events of his life in a list of nine events that I'll show you on the screen here. All right, just, just look at him with me. He was misunderstood by his family, sold into slavery to Potiphar, living in a strange country far from home, which is horrible all by itself. But he was given favor in Potiphar's house. So a guy named Potiphar, who was an Egyptian slave owner, bought him. And Potiphar was first used him as a slave, but he was so smart and got favored by God that he put him in charge of his entire household. So now he's chief of staff, so to speak. But then Potiphar's wife, because Joseph was incredibly handsome, she tried to lure him in to have relations with her. In fact, she actually seized him, said, come lie with me. And he, she grabbed him by the coat, and he just slipped out of it and ran, took off. Like, I can't do this. God, i got to honor God, and I've got to honor your husband. I'm, and he took off and left his coat in her hands. I, when I was a youth pastor, I used to tell uh, teenagers this story. I said, look, you ever find yourself in, in sexual temptation? I said, you do what Joseph does, run. I mean, 1 Corinthians says, flee immorality. And I don't think that's figurative. I mean, actually, run. I said, in fact, if you'll call me in the middle of the night on a Friday or Saturday night, I'll encourage you. And sure enough, the phone would ring 2 a.m. Hey, Pastor Chris, this, 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 I'm, I'm really close. I'm, I'm just, I'm really close. Run, really? Yeah, run. Get out of the car, run, run. And he'd go, ah, ah. I mean, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, a good jog will help you. It'll, it'll, all right. So anyway. Anyway, it works. Y'all try it. It just works. So he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Okay, and then she says, he raped me. She lied, and he gets thrown into prison for having integrity. Then, because he had God's favor, he was put in charge of all the prisoners. 
He uh, interprets the dream of the Pharaoh's chief cupbearer. And the guy says, thank you so much. Is there anything I can do for you? He says, yeah, when you get out of here, remember me. Get me out of here too. And he got out and didn't remember Joseph. He forgot him. So Joseph remained in prison two years longer. Then he interpreted Pharaoh's dream and became second in command of all Egypt. Now, you just saw in nine events everything that happened to Joseph. I want to go back to the list one more time, and I want a little crowd response here, okay? You may not be familiar with this, but just help, help a brother out here, okay? All right? And I want you to respond to me with one of two phrases, either give up or go on, based on you, how you think Joseph felt. Give up or go on. I mean, when he was misunderstood by his family, did he feel to give up or go on? Give up. Come on, try it again. Misunderstood by his family? Sold into slavery by Potiphar? Living in a strange country and far from home? Given favor in Potiphar's house? Yeah, you're, you're a little slow there, all right? Just um, a little weak. It's not a trick. These aren't a trick. Come on, everybody help me out. Falsely accused by Potiphar's wife? Thrown into prison? Put in charge of all the prisoners? Forgotten by the chief cupbearer? Remained in prison two years longer? Interpreted Pharaoh's dream? Became second in command of Egypt. I th- the point I'm trying to make is your life is going to look the same. And Joseph had, I studied it this week, twice as many give up moments as he had go on moments. The question is, what are you going to do when you're in the give up moment? Because that intersection is coming our way. It's coming. I have them all the time. And it's a dilemma. It really is. Do you give up or do you go on? And I'm just here. My name's Chris. I'm your friend. Just to tell you, don't give up, please. Please don't give up. Say, Chris, what keeps you going when you feel like giving up? The same thing that happened to Joseph, and that is he, even in the darkest places, he found favor in the sight of his God, and he knew that God was with him. And here's what we know. Romans chapter 8 says this. In fact, I want you to say the, two, the second two words out loud with me. And, we, come on, say it again. And we, well, do you? The truth is, sometimes we don't know. The truth is, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't really know if this is true anymore. And that's why the Bible says, here's where you've got to get to if you're going to be a go on kind of a person. You've got to get, get back, which I'm hopefully trying to help you do today, is we got to get you back to the we know place. This is the powerful part of this phrase right here. We know. We know. What do we know, Chris? We know that in all things, good and bad, pit or palace, we know that God is at work. And he works things for the good of those who love him to those who have been called according to his purpose, which, by the way, that's every one of you have been called to a purpose. It might be heading in the wrong direction, but I'm just here to remind you, get our eyes fixed in the right place, that God's at work. Here's the last one. Write it down. Don't give up on your dream, even if it's taken a long time to realize it. I mean, two years in prison is a long time. 23 years from 17 to 40. Now, from 17 to 40, now he's in Pharaoh's court. I mean, he is second in command of Egypt. He interpreted Pharaoh's dream, prophesied and predicted that there would be a seven-year famine, so we need to store up grain. And if you do, all the nations of the world will come to us, and we'll have enough for us, and we'll make boatloads of money, too, by selling the grain to other nations. And sure enough, it happened just like that, and Pharaoh put him in charge of everything. Well, that's easy. That's a fun part of the story. But what do you do in the, in the middle when you're cleaning up the slop of a prisoner that you're in charge of? Well, here's what you do. Habakkuk says it this way. The things that I plan (laughs) won't happen right away. That's not a fun verse, is it? Nobody would write that out and put it on the refrigerator. That's my favorite verse. It ain't going to happen right now. (laughs) But these things that God's planning, unfortunately, they just don't happen right away. Instead, you get three painful words, slowly, steadily, and surely. But slowly, steadily, and surely, the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. And I'm just Chris. 
your friend to remind you of that. If it seems slow, don't give up. Don't despair, for these things will surely come to pass. Just be, I hate this word, patient. Now, why is God so dead set on working this inside of us? Because he's more interested in your character than he is your comfort. Because he loves you. And he's patient, and you need to be patient. Because they will not be overdue a single day. And that's a promise. Now it's time to get into your discussion questions. So you can go ahead, hit stop, and enjoy your discussion time.